Welcome to the ATP Projects. You're with your host, Jeff, Steve, and Carissa. How are you, Carissa? Welcome. I'm good, thanks, G'day. guys. How Thank are you? you for having me. No, oh. it's great to have you on. Our pleasure, because we love brains trusts on this uh, show, and you're a massive brain in the area of nutrition. Um, you've been <laughs> practicing you. at least since 2015, where you are right. now, seven years, mm -hmm. and you specialize in genetics, digestive health, uh, which is quite handy, and hormones, because today we're going to be talking yes. about um, yes. fecal matters, I think. is uh, I don't know, we haven't come up with a great title, but um, is that a good title, or Knowing Your sounds Shit? Pretty, it yep. sounds pretty good to me. I like I like Knowing Your Shit, but let's call it Fecal Matters. <laughs> yeah, I think it depends on what side you fall off, whether you're, you're cool and hip or whether you're a little bit like me. Well, I'm cool and hip, so oh, I know you're not, Steve. Yeah. But what I was going to say is the thing I love as well, too, sort of just quickly going through your bio, is that you started off really um, having a, an appreciation and love for food. Mm. Um, mm. And again, we say all the time on the podcast that, you know, food is medicine and that all, you know, health starts in the gut as per Hippocrates, which is amazing, you know, a dude thousands of years ago, you yeah. know, sort of worked this out, right? So in terms then, I guess, of um, do you want to just talk a little bit about your background, Carissa, how you got into the yeah. space, the journey, the evolution, mm. if you like, in terms of how you started working, you know, in the sort of the, the food industry and, and sort of how, yeah. how it came to be where you are now, including up to, you know, being the, the, the host um, uh, of, uh, of your podcast as well too with, uh, with Jessica. Yeah, so um, my journey, I guess, was very similar to probably like a lot of people you have on the show, you go, you go through like your own sort of health issues. So I had some really bad mental health stuff when I was probably in my early 20s, so really debilitating anxiety onset just out of nowhere. Like I wasn't crazy unhealthy, but I was just being a 20-year-old drinking and running amok and mm. probably not eating the best food. Um, but just got this debilitating anxiety out of nowhere that couldn't be controlled. And um, so that kind of led me on, I guess, a path because obviously mainstream medicine was probably my go-to to date. My mum was a nurse. We grew up in just, you know, standard Australian household. So I guess the only option for me was medication at the time. Um, and I was like, well, my little brain being the way it is, and I know you guys like that question everything. Um, yes, I was like, well, I don't really know if this is a path I want to go down and I'm not opposed to that path for people, but I just kind of started doing a lot of research and, and, and dietize, diet, like diarying what I ate and things like that. And I came across like a lot of my triggers for me were food related um, and also oral contraception, like or OCP related for me as well. So yeah. I just kind of went on over a couple of years, went on a journey and changed a lot of things about my diet and how I ate. Um, and obviously went off the oral contraceptive pill, which was a massive game changer for the actual onset of the panic attacks, not the anxiety itself, but then went on to like a big journey of managing stress and yeah. And so I pretty much, yeah, now, like, I'm not going to say I live anxiety free because we all have levels of anxiety and that's healthy, obviously, but it was a big eye opener for me as to like, why the hell is no one talking about this? <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. So then I was like, well, I'm going to start studying food. I already worked in food. I ran some um, cafes and restaurants and stuff around Brisbane. So I already loved food and I loved eating healthy. And, but I, yeah, I just thought there's got to be so much more in this because by changing just how I ate and what I ate and, you know, a couple of things in my life, I was actually able to significantly reduce, reduce anxiety, but also massively improve my quality of life. So, <sighs> Other things that I think came from that at the time too, as I got into studying and learning about food, I started to realize that other things that I'd actually influenced by changing my diet and my microbiome, which I didn't know anything about a microbiome at the time, but I started to realize that um, I was mum and dad's allergy kid. I grew up, I was always reacting to things. I had sinus, I had hay fever. Looking back, I probably was quite constipated most of my life. Like I didn't realize that, but we just had a lot of white like white flowers and white breads. Like mum and dad fed us beautifully, like vegetables and fiber and stuff, but there was, it was a very wheat dominant diet. Um, so for me, that obviously caused some gastrointestinal issues as well. But by removing some of the foods that were, I guess, inflammatory for me and causing mood issues, I actually cleared up a whole host of other things as well. I, um, I don't get really allergies, even seasonal allergies anymore. Um, my immune system is completely different. Um, yeah, so I guess there was a lot in that, that even like retrospectively, I look back on now and I'm like, wow, I did a lot of work without even realizing just by changing my diet. And then you go through and study it all and work in it. And then you get the behind the scenes of how you actually did that, which I think is really cool. So 
Yeah, so I studied it, um, started working with Jess in 2015. So, yeah, and we went straight into the gut health space. Um, I absolutely loved that already. I did some functional testing when I was actually finishing my degree, which wasn't as readily offered. I don't know what the degrees are like now, um, but I yeah loved I loved all of that stuff. I've always been a bit of a tester, mm. so it was kind of good. I had some really great lecturers at the time that were on board with letting me use some of their accounts to do some of the functional testing that was available at the time, and that's absolutely changed massively in the field in the eight years that I've been working in it now. And went into the gut health space with Jess, like just head first. We started doing stool testing, getting our heads around that watching that grow and evolve. But then I absolutely love hormones and epigenetics as well. So I dived into that space and spent a lot of time working in estrogen detox and breast cancer prevention and and risk assessment and the genetics involved in that. And here I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Incredible. It's, it's, it's funny. There's so many similarities in terms of likes. I mean, um, massive massive interest for me on estrogen at the moment it's kind of one of these things um I that, <laughs> that, that that steve and i've got some some podcasts coming up in the future and one of them that we really want to dive into is estrogen in both men and women mm. and yes. what looks healthy and what looks good now it's really funny so on the way here i typically have a coffee every morning and i'm just mindful of the amount of plastics and the amount of things that go on now i get a hot coffee and now i don't drink milk uh, anymore this is on almond milk but i love my morning coffee and I'm sitting here and, and I went, hang on a minute. So the thin plastic um, uh, uh, yeah. thing, and you know what I mean? Like, I, you know, and it's so funny because I take these off now. Um, it's like yeah. also the little strip on your razors. I pour mine into a glass There cup. you go. <laughs> and, and it's funny. It's just these things that sometimes if you're not being mindful, it gets away. But it's I had a coffee and I reckon that they had – because Tony's actually my wife's a, a barista uh, and she makes it to the right temperature. But a lot of the time they actually overheat it. And then you're drinking oh, through this much. thin plastic lid that's on the top. Now, I'm just wondering how much estrogen that's infusing, you know what I mean? And, and then you know, how much you know, estrogen your body's having to process. So it's the same as I heard somebody the other day about the razors, how they've got that lubricating strip on the razor. And one of the guys I, I, oh. I was listening to, he actually pulls that off. So I've now started pulling that off as well too. Oh. So I actually want to have a look into a lot of these other, if you like, mm. and we did a podcast on heating up your food in the microwave and absolutely not heating it up in plastic. Mm. And in fact, we even found out after that podcast, realistically, you shouldn't use the microwave. Now, I appreciate <laughs> we live in the modern world yeah. and that is very <laughs> difficult to be perfect. And there is no such thing as perfect. And we're not it's here not. to sign you into the church of Steve mm. and Jeff that you must live this way because we're not like we're that either. Members. You know what I mean? But there's certain things, I think, certain major things, um, Carissa, that you've probably noticed as well too in terms of um, some low-hanging fruit and some diet changes and some ways that you process things differently. So as far as obviously, yes, your microbiome, but also, and you mentioned it sort of before about the wheat, and Steve's got a story around his, you know, ankylosing spondylitis mm. in terms of that and changing, yeah. you know, uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah. So with regards to you, what are the, what are maybe the, the top sort of three things or, or few things that you did that made the biggest impact to your health? And I know that you're going to say diet, but like, was yeah. there something specific is yeah. there something yeah, that you yeah, avoided right. and is there something yeah. that you added that made a big difference? Yeah. So I think one of the biggest things, and I don't want to demonize this for everyone because I feel like there is so much noise in our space that sometimes if we put fear into people around things and it's not for everyone, then everyone gets confused. And that's obviously what I spend a lot of time educating my clients around is let's start with the basics. Yeah. So, but for me personally, um, one of the biggest things that I found for me from a gut, mood and allergy perspective was wheat. Mm. Um, I just, it seriously, even now, like I, I test the theory, I'm a little shit of a practitioner because I'm like, I'll get a really good run. I'm like, right, I can bring this back in. Like just a bit of sourdough, yeah. right? Just yeah. a bit of sourdough. And, and I know after a couple of days, we go on a camping trip and I run out of my, run out of my gluten-free pastas and things like that. So I'm like, I'll be right. Um, so I know for me, from a gut perspective and from a mood perspective, more so than anything, how much wheat actually impacts me. Yep. Um, I also have a subclinical thyroid condition, which I found out on the course of all of my stuff as well. Again, never been managed with pharma, like pharmacological interventions. I just manage that myself. Um, but obviously I do feel like that can be a big driver for that. And I know the research injury is out depending on who you talk to about, you know, gluten and auto 
autoimmune and all that sort of stuff. But I do know for me massively just in terms of my you know, energy, motivation, dopamine, mood states and everything like that, how much if I just change that one thing, the ripple effect is huge. So that was a big one, big one for me. And I was lucky at the time I worked with some girls in a cafe that were just starting to, that were just in the, in the whole food health space and they were all on the spelt breads and, and things like that. So, so I kind of moved into that, but an absolute removal of gluten has actually been what my body has needed to really function at its optimal from an energy, mood, gut, allergy perspective. Um, so that's probably one of the biggest things I removed. Um, the other thing that I probably started to really include was protein. <laughs> So again, I know it sounds really simple, but anyone in practice, I think that you talk to and anyone who's training, like I reckon I have in a year of seeing hundreds of clients, maybe two or three that are actually nailing their protein requirements based on their energy expenditure, exercise, obviously same thing. But I feel like protein is something that people really fall short on and then understanding the need for the balance of protein with your fiber from day to day in terms of your cortisol and insulin balance is massive because I think if you can really stabilize your insulin and cortisol, you can have massive impacts on your anxiety and mm. your mental health across the day and your energy. So yeah. for me, I know it sounds simple, like you remove one thing and include one thing, but the ripple effects are, are, are astronomical for me and a lot of the people I work with. So no, does that I, answer I, the question I, enough? <laughs> it does. And I love that 80-20 yeah. rule because typically what you'll find absolutely and there are nuances and things that you can go down and where you can tweak things. Things, but these broad stroke things, and Steve, I know that you're a huge fan of of removing dairy and wheat yeah, from, from, from your diet. Not a fan. Um, so, in terms <laughs> of that, just quickly for people that are listening I that are going, "Wow, that's really interesting." What uh, what did you switch in? Like you mentioned, spelt. But what else? What did you sw switch? Because I mean, oftentimes people go, "Right, I'm not going to eat this," and then I'm not going to eat really bread, true. and then they're going. What do I have instead? <laughs> and how do I structure my meals, right? So, now, yeah. and, and again, there's lots of different people. I know myself, and we, Steve and I were just talking about this recently, is that I get excellent, excellent results using more of a ketogenic-based diet but, and, and removing carbs that, out. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's not for everyone, right? So I, I appreciate that as well too. But in terms of yourself personally, what yeah. did you – what did, when you took that out, did you, did you swap something in? Were you mindful to put something in its place? Yeah. Or? Yeah, I definitely was. And I think because I realized the importance of having adequate complex carbs in terms of blood sugar stabilization for me and anxiety, like what I've realized over the course of working on my own mental health is that an insulin, an insulin spike and drop can feel a lot the same as an anxiety or panic mm. attack in the initial onsets. Right. Um, and so even looking back over my journey, I'm like, was a lot of this actual anxiety or did I have a blood sugar drop that brought on a panic attack? Mm. And I think when you actually get into working with this space with clients and things like that, sometimes when I have chats to clients, we really look at their diet and we really look at where panic attacks and things are coming in. Anyway, and I'm totally going off track here. I do that. Um, no, not at all. So, for me, for me, carbohydrates were definitely something I was mindful of making sure I still had in my life. So I started switching to spelt um, and rye-based products initially. So obviously, they were, they were all still really easy to get. There's some beautiful bakeries around Brisbane that focused on the more whole grain versions of those. Um, but then I just kind of went straight into all of your beautiful gluten-free grains. When I when I went to God's to stage, I'm like, well, I'm going to completely remove gluten and see how I go off that. Um I still kept oats in for a period of time. So obviously your whole grain oats, they were, they were fine for me um, and still are in moderation. It's not something I eat a lot of, but I do focus heavily on a lot of the whole grain um, gluten-free pastas. So things that are variations of like your, your buckwheats and your quinoas and your rice. Rice itself, I think, is a bloody amazing underrated carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, I love rice. Sweet potato, um, and then getting into some of the other kind of like other grains like your millets and your teffs. Personally, for me, I need more complex carbs. I do do quite a bit of exercise. So I do find, yeah, like I definitely keep an element of carbohydrate in there with definitely my breakfast and my lunches, and that's what I've sort of substituted in. So Perfect. It's good. It's so, good. so one of the things I always like to, to find out is – what do you eat for breakfast? Because I reckon breakfast is one of the hardest meals for, for a lot of people when they're sort of yeah. – so what, what would you have for breakfast? 
I have two breakfasts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Second <laughs> breakfast, it's like a hobbit. <laughs> it's like Homer Simpson yeah, when he discovered like... a breakfast, a, a meal between <laughs> breakfast and brunch. You know, that, that, <laughs> so you, you've, you've, you've discovered that. Terrific. I've well, discovered what, that. So what, so what do you I eat am... for breakfasts then? <laughs> My breakfast. So I always have a smoothie yep. um, because I always, I am very um, protein focused as well. I love to make sure for me um, and for me personally, I do really well if I get a good bulk of my protein in before mid-morning. Yep. So I'm usually aiming for somewhere between, uh, I'm going to say around 45 grams of protein before I even get to lunch. Well, so wow. for me, what that looks like is I will always have, and I do get up early, guys, too. Like I'm a 4.30 a.m. So. <laughs> Join the club. Yuck. <laughs> no, yeah. Keep that. You Great guys talk. can keep so that. <laughs> My partner's the complete opposite. He's like, would you go away? Isn't it um, so funny? It seems to happen all the bloody time. My wife's the same as well too. She's not up at 4.30, but she's typically up at 5, five oh, yes, when she's do. training. Yep. So, yep. Yeah, I'm with her. I'm with her. So for me, I figure like if you've got like if, if you're awake for six hours to seven hours before lunch, you do need two meals. That's my justification. Yep. Anyway, so I definitely have a smoothie. I use a good amount of protein in my smoothie. I use like um, some fruits, so berries, banana, mango, whatever is in season. Again, careful not to overload on sugars and fruits. Definitely more protein dominant. Add an element of fat. I don't have dairy either. So for me, it's usually like a good nut based milk that's not jacked with all the oils and some of the other crap that's mm. on the market yes. um, and I might just chuck a few other little things in it so my smoothie is probably my first thing because when I go back from my training or my big walk or run or whatever I've kind of done like I like to that really works well for me post-exercise getting those um, amino acids in quite quickly and then so that's usually probably around the 6 37 o'clock mark I'm having that yep. and then probably around the 9 9 30 mark is when I actually have a more um, like something that's more a bit more edible. So for me, again, it is protein focused. So it's usually like either two boiled eggs, um, some fish or something like that um, with some fiber, so some veggies, and then an element of more complex carbs. And my smoothie doesn't have a lot of complex carbs. It's usually more definitely protein and fat focused. And then that's my complex carbs come in around mid-morning with some more protein. Oh, and great. that holds me through to about 1 o'clock and then I have my lunch. Lovely. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, 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 it's always nice. And I, I, people are always interested, oh, okay, what do the professionals eat? So, you know, so obviously, <laughs> no, no, because it is. It's like, okay, sort of, and people listening to this as well too, you know, the amount of times we people are going, oh, I really should get rid of dairy and, mm. and um, you know, wheat out of my diet, but how do I practically do it? So it's that's so great. Difficult. That's great. Yeah, a lot of Australians listening to this and pe people who are overseas will have wheat or dairy up to three to three meals a day. Mm. You know, they can have wheat bits and milk for breakfast. They can have a, a cheese sandwich for lunch and pasta noodles or something like that for dinner with, again, you know, some sort of dairy ice cream or something. It's it's really, Australians are terrible at eaters. We, we just have that wheat and and dairy focus. It's crazy. Yeah, so with I regards agree. to your um, your stool tests and, and, and mm. tell us the evolution of how you started, you know, utilizing these as a tool. Yeah. I know that you're a huge fan of these. Like what have been some of the, the aha moments, the breakthrough moments? What have you noticed with your clients? I mean, obviously you're working with them, talking a lot around nutrition and diet. Um, yep. You know, so do you want to talk a little bit about your history around stool tests? I mean, they are a fantastic yeah. tool. We we absolutely love them. And again, that comes back to, I guess, the overarching umbrella sort of statement that all health starts in the gut. So if you can really, you know, remove some of those bad things, um, you know, get the bacteria doities and the firmicutes and sort of better ratios. But what what has been some of your aha moments, if if you like, around the the whole stool test yeah. thing? Yeah. Um. So there's been there's actually been quite a lot. I do absolutely love testing. I am totally honest with my clients though, especially some of the clients that are a little bit more compromised that I do believe testing has come so far, but it has its limitations and it's still got a long way to go. I still think we are hundred percent in the infancy of what we actually know about the gut microbiome. Mm. So sometimes what, you know, what research may be starting to look and talk about, but also sometimes what the gut testing companies are telling us their tests offer isn't always this, exactly what it is when it plays out in practice. And I do love to do a lot of testing and use it, but then anecdotally see what it actually shows. Because there's strengths and weaknesses in all the stool tests that um, are definitely noticed um, and using like lots and lots and lots of them. So 
Definitely over the years, I think the thing that has really changed is that when I started using stool testing, like probably, you know, nine or 10 years ago and looking into that space, we were still doing a lot of culture-based testing. Mm. I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember what it's called, you guys. I've heard you guys talk about it as well. Um, but it's more like obviously the year they just take you, do your three stool samples, and then they're doing like a macro macroscopic look at it for parasites and stuff like that and then they're putting it on a petri dish culturing it letting it sit in a lab in a certain environment and whatever grows is you know what they're sort of picking up and telling you is going on in your gut microbiome so we obviously know now that there's a lot of room for error in that style of testing but it's what we had Mm. at the time and i still think it definitely had its relevance absolutely and for some people and a lot of clients you did gain some really good information information out of obviously there was massive limitations in that testing in terms of you know what we can see now in terms of your commensals because i think like obviously the older style testing you know i think where we have we might have had bifidos lactobacillus Mm. and maybe one other yeah (laughs) but there's only three there's only three in the gut (laughs) oh that's fine that's all you need to look at yeah it's quite crazy, and 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 I mean, you know, you, you, crazy. your your speciality, you know, digestive health, hormone genetics, they're all regulated by the gut microbiome. It's, it's 100%. quite, it's, it, it's it's quite incredible how important yeah. this is. Yet, if you go to the average, and I'm, I'm, I'll get out of our lifestyle and go into the average Joe six pack on the street, they probably have never That's even considered. Yeah, well, you know, they they, they wouldn't Joe have considered their, <laughs> yeah, their yeah, gut microbiome. The, the average and Joe six pack. I mean, yep. like, yeah, it's probably Joe bare belly. Let's yeah, face it. yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, they they'll, they'll know their cholesterol levels or blood pressure, they'll have those things checked or whatever, but they don't know their gut microbiome. And I'd argue that's one of the most important things you, you can look at. And it's modified yeah. by so many, you know, healthy diet and exercise and even sunshine changes your gut microbiome. So it's, it's yeah. radically changed by not just your diet, but also stress yeah. levels. You know, you mentioned... Stress levels. Yep. You mentioned before about, you know, anxiety and all that sort of thing. That can be driven from the gut too, of course. You know, most serotonin is made mm-hmm. in your gut. Yeah. And serotonin is a, a, a neurotransmitter that really makes you feel good. And I mean, you know, in, in your clinical practice, so who would you test? Uh, you know, who would you recommend gets tested for a stool test? Yeah, so it honestly, it honestly does depend. Um, some people come in and because obviously we've got a, reputa- a bit of a reputation in, in, in the industry that we are, you know, we do love our testing and people have listened to our podcast and they're like, I just want to come in and do a gut test. So there's people that come in and that's specifically what they want. Um, and then there's people that come in and they might not know much about us, but they've seen some other practitioners. They, they have already done some gut testing. And then there's people that come in and their gut's a total mess and it just would it helps us kind of see the forest for the trees a bit mm. as well. Honestly, I think for health, like if you're interested and you want to know, anyone can do a stool test. I think I do think you, there's no, you've got nothing to lose by learning more about your microbiome. Mm. Um, you've only got things to gain. So... I, I, if I have clients coming in and they they're interested and they want to and they want to spend the cash or I think they need to spend cash and I'm absolutely recommending they do a stool test for sure. Um, there's different types of stool tests though, and I think sometimes this is where having a consultation with a practitioner it can be a good idea purely because there's um, there's some great tests on the market but there's a lot of crap as well with everything as we know some of the there's probably one really good direct to consumer test which is the uh, are we allowed to say names on here yeah. testing companies sure. Sure. yeah yep. yeah yeah so the um, probably the best direct to consumer test on the market would be the microba test so yeah. if you're someone they do the metagenomic testing they are really 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 up to date with their research my god they're up to date with research um their test is you know and in ballpark of pricing it's a it's a well priced test there's other tests on the market probably for the same cost which i think it's around 350 to 400 dollars at the moment that probably doesn't get the give the level of information that the microba test does but then beyond the microba test there's obviously like your doctor's data um gi 360 um your um, genova diagnostics their tests so their tests again like they kind of overlap the PCR technology, which is the way stool testing has gone, which is obviously the, you know, the genomic testing and looking at all of that. They overlap that still with a little bit of the microbial culture testing because my understanding is, and definitely what we've seen, is that if you go straight PCR testing at the moment, you don't pick up sometimes a lot of the pathogens. Mm. 
So, and so sometimes there can be information that you want, like a, a bit of either or, and in clinical practice, sometimes that is relevant. Obviously, it's always relevant. Um, so, yeah, so again, it just depends on what people come in for, what their gut presentation is, what whether or not we'll recommend a test. If they're keen to do one, absolutely, then we pick a test that we think is most suited for them. Yeah. So, no, no, that's mm-hmm. excellent. Right. Actually, Steve and Alyssa have just finished a, a, yeah. a, a 20 person test, actually, with, with, with Microba, which yeah. was absolutely fascinating. Oh. Um, I think, Steve, you're still writing. Mm. Um, like, we did some, some seminars and some dissemination of the information. It's ridiculous. We've probably got months and months and months worth of of presentations that oh, we can, it goes we can on take forever. out of I mean, it. We, we tested so the effect. Exciting. Oh, it's such an exciting space. Yeah. And we learnt, uh, and I should say Steve and Elisma, because they're the experts, learnt, we had some theories and we had some observations from uh, anecdotal feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, and, oh, my gosh, it was oh. so much more than what we actually thought. And the, wow. the, the excitement in the space, I, I definitely agree with you. I think we did a podcast a few years back where we said if you can – but the more that we understand the gut, the more that we can actually manipulate it in a good way, like get it back to nature, because we always say nature knows best. Yeah, um, it, I, I, yeah I agree. I think the, the expression of that then is going to take us back to being fitter, healthier, live longer with less disease, getting rid of the lipopolysaccharides. Yep. I mean, like just amazing stuff. And we're starting now to to prove that. I, I guess yep. the thing for me is, is that whether it comes down to disease states, which a lot of people focus on, the other thing I'm interested in is working with athletes to improve performance mm-hmm. as well too. Um, cool. You know, there's so much amazing, amazing, amazing stuff there. I, I think for me more than... More than anything, it's 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 you're right. We're right at that sort of tipping point, and we're starting to learn. Like we had a guy who had um, rosacea all mm. over his face, and Steve was working with him, and he had been a shut in for years. Basically, yeah. he'd become so embarrassed by this huge red yeah. rosacea, yeah. yeah, over his face within a period of. 72, 72 hours, hours. Yeah. it pretty much will completely disappear just by changing, by treating his gut and by changing his, his microbiome. It's funny you say that. I recently had a client the same and she you had actually, her face had become addicted to the corticosteroids. Ah. So we had to put her, is, it, is that what they, they put on the face? It's the steroid creams. Yeah, They and, do, um, yeah. It's a 1%. Yeah. It's called, oh, I won't mention brand name, but it's but, 1% corticosteroid yeah. cream. Yep. So she, same thing, she'd had rosacea so badly, she'd been on these creams for so long and then obviously tried to detox herself off the cream, but then the rebound, rebound. effect was yeah. freaking horrible. So we obviously did some dietary interventions and I'm sure we probably all know what they are, but I'm not going to say it because then everyone with rosacea might, you know, anyway, obviously case by case, but yes. did a lot of dietary stuff and any inflammatory supplement support, but I just said, you're going to, we have to do- detox you off this cream and mm. it's not going to be pretty. Yep. Like we can cut, we can control and work with the inflammation, but it's, it's going to get shittier before it gets better. Right. So we did that and she just stayed home for a couple of days. Probably it was probably almost seven days to 10, like just only went out when she had to the sure. poor thing because the rebound, she'd been on this cream for, I think six months or something like wow. crazy. Yeah. yeah. And, Put that um, in perspective, corticosteroid cream should be ceased after seven days. Yeah. That's a medical yeah. recommendation. Not, not, not seven months. Seven months. Yeah. Months. And the doctors were just saying to her, it's fine just to stay on it, which oh, obviously oh. she's a smart girl. She knows yeah. better than that. Um, so yeah, so we did that, but obviously now like her, yeah, just exactly right. Literally dietary intervention and a, a, not even a lot of supplements. Like I'm talking three. Yep. <laughs> yep. Jeez. And three supplements, but most it. of it was diet, yep. big reduce yeah. in that reduction in that histamine response and gut micro, you know, gut microbiota. And um, yeah, and obviously then we went through and worked out what are the big triggers as well. Like beyond, you know, working with the histamine response, do we need to look at estrogen? Are we looking at food chemical sensitivities, which we obviously were a bit as well. So yeah, so agreed, like it's massive. But I'm so excited for what you guys have done there with Elisma. That is going to be well, incredible. Yeah, it, My it, God. It, it's, it's a little, it was, it's a, cool. it was, it was only cool. on 20 people, but what we told them was just take polyphenols and don't change yeah. your diet, don't change your drugs, don't do anything, you know, don't, definitely don't see someone like you. We just wanted to test and isolate what the polyphenols would do. And in, in four of the 20 people that wiped out the Klebsiella, wiped out E. coli, they, no, like there was zero of it left, you know, so it, quite yeah. incredible and all these miraculous and, results. And did you give them specific polyphenol rich, rich foods to eat? Did you give them some of the hard hitters or were we, you just like, we just want you to include more colour and focus on this? What you've just said then is what my advice would be to the general public out there. But yeah. no, we were looking at specific ones that we know have been removed from the diet for, yes. for, for a part. So <laughs> How yeah, absolutely. And look, from that as well too, we're working even further to look at specific, you know, 
disease states and actually working with practitioners um, effectively we're taking it to that next level but we know that there's a long road to go mm. as you say we're, we're sort of there's a lot of test and error there's a lot of observation but the nice thing is is that being able to test and I know that you're a huge fan of this mm. Carissa which we are too you can actually define what that looks like and you can use that to be able to suggest treatments for people which the downside is is brilliant it's, it's mm. virtually nothing because these yeah. things are just enriched from the food. But one of the things that you said before, and I just want to come back to, a lot of people will hear, oh, okay, so I've got to go and have a test, or I want to have a test, or I've got a problem. And they'll go, oh, you know, okay, it's going to cost several hundred dollars to do that. But yet people will spend thousands of dollars a year on supplementation just having a crack mm. at it. Yeah. Now, if you've got a specific problem or, or something that you really want to look at, the best thing you could do is get a diagnosis. I mean, you don't jump into your car, you're hearing a clanging sound and go, oh, I'm, I'm going to change this tire. Oh, hang on, I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the fan belt or I'm going to... You, you go and see a mechanic <laughs> yes. who then diagnoses what the problem is and then yep. creates a, a point of action. It's the same thing with your health as well too. Um, um, as I said, we speak a lot about disease states. I'm really keen, really, really, really keen to actually start working with athletes as well too because I reckon this has been something that we haven't looked at enough of is actually how we remap the gut, how we actually focus, eliminate certain things to actually enhance people's response. Like Akkermansia, which is one of my absolute favourite um, gut <laughs> yeah, bugs. Love, I keep, love old Akka. Yeah, yeah, and it's one of those things as well too. You know, Obviously, it, 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 with the, the carbon mucus and all the rest of it, people who are exercising more are going to have more of that. But I reckon there's a real exciting space there. But just Coming back to, to testing and obviously then recommending it for anyone who's listening to this, and this is where obviously uh, you can go see Carissa and, and get that diagnosis, have an understanding, and then actually create a plan of how to, how to move forward. So, um, yep. yeah. Any, anything on that, Carissa, that you wanted to add? No, I think that's I think that's perfect. Like it is, it is about creating a, creating a plan and obviously understanding that. Like I said, testing does have it limit, its limitations. But if you work with a practitioner who at least understands as much as they can and has worked anecdotally with a lot of people, you are in good hands. It doesn't have to be me. It can be anyone else that loves this space as much as I do and works in it, um, and anyone else at the clinic or other practitioners. But like, uh, go with someone who does understand it and love it because, like. There's so much in it and I think there's a lot of people doing and offering gut testing. We end up with a lot of them at the clinic or clients that have Seen, like seeing practitioners that may not necessarily be qualified that are giving advice on these tests, which mm. is still a scary space. And it's yep. unfortunately one of the downsides to the holistic health space is that regulation is still not at its best sometimes. And there's people out there really taking advantage of the game. So, yeah, so, but definitely the plan is amazing. But understanding too, that if your gut is quite compromised and it has been quite compromised for a period of time, don't expect results in two months. Mm. Understand that this is a process and understand that we're going to hold your hand, but essentially we are here to guide you. You have to do the work. Yes. <laughs> there is yes. not a magic bullet or a magic pill that is going to fix 20 years of, you know, an unhappy microbiome. And if you're ultimately not willing to work on your stress and you're not willing to, you know, just do cover those broad brushstrokes that we were talking about before, like make, you've got to put time aside for your health and you've got to put time aside for your food. If you don't want to do that, then I don't expect massive results. No. <laughs> I call it. I call it the microwave um, society, because because <laughs> right now, as we expect instant results, mm. like you know, we turn the TV oh, on, we jump in the car, and, and I think for a lot of the times as well too, you talk about this magic pill th um, idea <gasps> as well, is because a lot of the time people would go and see uh, health care practitioners, whether it be traditional doctors or what have you, and a lot of times like here, take this pill, and people start feeling better immediately because mm. it's masking the issue as opposed to actually dealing with the root cause. So yeah. th this is kind of part of the psyche I think that we've got to break away from is that you, you can't, as you said before, you can't fix years and years and years of abuse um, you know, that's led to a chronic disease state in, in a matter of a, a day or two. I mean, we've been fortunate like with the go authorization, but that's an exception to the rule. Typically, these things yeah. take take a long time. Take a long time to, to, to fix, but it's definitely worth it. I got a go. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry you I was go. Just, I was just, no, I was just going to say as well. Like the other thing, like even just with the guy with rosacea, a lot of those times, those people are willing to do all the work. Yeah. You have your A plus students that are like, yeah. yes, I'll manage my stress, and they do all the things, and they do get amazing results quite quickly. But I agree, like they are sometimes the exception and not the norm, and there's a lot of work that has to be done for people. So yeah. 
It's great because, I mean, you, you mentioned doing the work in that, and I, and I was on your uh, Instagram page, which is terrific. I love all the, the stuff on there, especially the pictures of your dog. Uh, but <laughs> but you. I, I found, I found <laughs> a quote you, I found a quote you put on there from uh, Wayne Fields that says, the best, the best six doctors anywhere, and no one can deny it, is sunshine, water, rest, air, exercise, and diet. And, I mean, isn't that incredibly powerful? Because... So I, I totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. It's like what I totally mean. Totally agree. You know, it's like well, we work for a supplement company, obviously, and, and those we we'd still agree with those top six. Oh, one hundred percent. Look, at yeah. the end of the day, I, I mean, one of the I should probably put on a t-shirt. Nature knows best. It just absolutely mm. nature knows best. We're getting back to nature. I, I almost feel, and here's my conspiracy theory tinfoil oh, hat. Okay. Hang on, I'm going to get banned here. <laughs> yep. Is that it? Almost feels like everything is designed to actually destroy. N- n- nature and our interaction with nature the, the way that things food has been completely i call it franken food now mm. all this all this gmo food the, the chemicals and the pesticides and look I, I understand that we live in a modern world and you can't completely separate as we sit here right now steve mm. we're surrounded by you know 4g 5g i don't know where we are but you know what i mean like there's, <laughs> there's all sorts of there's all sorts of you know chemicals and, and all the rest yeah. of it are that, those plants on the wall real are they helping offset any of that ah. no, <laughs> fake no they're fake um and that, but that's exactly right it's exactly right so <laughs> like everything that we're surrounded by in the modern world i mean i love elisma because elisma yeah. lives on i think it's 500, 500 acres, acres two bush. hours out of bush she's uh. not even on the grid like she is like that's, solar yeah, she's got her own i i buy her honey because like i love yeah, her honey. it's wild bush honey. honey but like you know depending on obviously where you are for the for the for the modern um guy or girl who's living in the city who's surrounded by the stuff all the time um don't capitulate to everything go okay what can i do to help offset it you know antioxidants to obviously mm. look after the free radicals and you know eating better exercising there's certain things that you can obviously to do to offset it but I, I with that statement sunshine mm. i mean i say to people as well too if you're feeling down depressed not feeling particularly well and i know this sounds very throwaway advice but Go spend some time with your loved one and watch a funny movie. Mm. Keep, just take an immediate yeah. break and go away for a long weekend. Go for a walk on the beach and just detox mm. from the stresses that constantly bombard you. Do you want? Um, so what we did this year, um, we're like obviously mad campers and stuff like that. But recommended by one of my clients and her husband is we. It's called Twelve in Twelve. So it's perfect. It's just about stress reduction and getting out into nature. But you try and do 12 camping trips or 12 nature trips in 12 months. Wow. So we have mani- we've done 10 in 12 this year. Yeah, <laughs> so beautiful. Far. Beautiful. I don't, think we'll, I don't think we'll get our 12 in 12 because obviously TikTok, we've got three weeks. Yep. But just committing to it doesn't have to be complicated. It can literally be, and I haven't counted any of the hikes I've done. We've just can't, counted camping trips. Um, but yeah, but I just say to my clients, I, do, I say exactly the same thing. It sounds, some of the advice we give as practitioners sounds so basic but if you haven't got the basics the noise is just going to confuse you right like there's so much noise in the health industry and it's so good because we're at an age and uh, where we've got so much access to information but the the information causes stress for a lot of people like health anxiety is at its highest as far as i'm concerned like with my clients that i'm seeing and they're so worried about the like all the little things. I'm like, just focus on what you can control and focus on like if you're not even getting out and going for a half an hour walk every morning, if you're getting up, rushing around, like, you know, change that before you worry about the mushrooms and all of these other little things you've got to get in. Like, yes, they're all beautiful and beneficial and completely relevant, but if you're missing the big pictures, like not exactly like stress, sunshine, mm. you know, just balancing your meals, like they're all the things you can do and they don't cost you anything. So. No, yeah. and it's, I'm almost positive, and I think we've mentioned this before, Thomas Jefferson said one of the best things that you can actually do is go for a brisk half hour walk every morning. Yeah. Because I, I, not only obviously is it good for exercise and, you know, cortisol getting everything sort of moving and mm. what have you, but I've, I've got a strong feeling that it actually helps with brainwave activity as well too. Oh, so, yeah. But look, these things seem so simplistic that I think yeah. a lot of the time people will dismiss them. Them. Hey, and don't be stressed out about not hitting your 12 ca- I'm kidding, I'm kidding. You know, you know, it's sort of like, it's like my wife's an A-type personality and we joke about this all the time. It's like, slow down and smell the flowers. And she's like, oh, I've won. You know, it's like, you know, it's just, we just need to chill out a little bit. But I, I think laughter is a great medicine as well too. I think just, just 
detoxing mm-hmm. and just spending time with family. My favourite time of year is coming up. I absolutely love Christmas because I live it's vicariously through my children, right? right? Yeah, like, so like it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> but we've got a holiday planned. We've got some time off, and I tell you what, I'm just going to absolutely forget the freaking emails. Yeah. Put the phone away. Yep. You're not going to be able to contact me. I'm just going because you, awesome. you need that downtime and that and that and that switch off time. But this is the thing. It's well too. I was thinking. I reckon part of this. Um, healthy at any weight, you know, that we did a podcast on, Steve, I reckon it might have come from that, from that level of, if you can't be perfect, then I'm not doing it at all. Yeah. And that's a really all or nothing mentality is yeah. terrible. I had to get myself yeah. out of it because yeah. I've got a, I have a very, I had a very much all or nothing. If it wasn't perfect, I'm not doing anything. If I'm, unless I'm, you know, training six times a week, I'm eating my meals, I'm doing this. And if it's not perfect, and then as you get older, children, business, mm. life, you start to recognize, hang on a minute, I can't do that all the way that I want to. Mm-hmm. So therefore, I will then, you start using that excuse not to do anything. And exactly. that's probably the, maybe that's a little bit what you're talking about, Chris. That's not the way to go forward. No, nah, the only it's, dangerous yeah. exercise is none really, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. And you know, drinking water is simple. I mean, this has got a, a, a product in it. I can probably say the name of it, can't I? No. No. Um, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> what are you thinking of the legalities like of it? Know. Yeah, yeah. I will tell you off camera and I'll tell you okay. about the study no, you, off camera. You can, Steve. I, I laugh. We, we, we made um, getting getting deplatform popular before even yeah. Trump got <laughs> deplatform. So, so you know, we, we got deplatform. I won't say now. what it does. Uh, apparently, we can go back on Twitter, which is great. Oh, really? <laughs> wow, yeah. So we were allowed... banned from Twitter. Oh, no, we, probably we, not. we were banned from saying anything about anything. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story I'd. Yeah, we'll, we'll tell you about it another time. But we were banned, we were deplatformed, we had to change the health structure of our company. Uh, this is a, a water, but it's, it's got beauty in it, which is a product, and that's what I'll say about it that I don't really okay. need to take. But, you know. Well, it's really funny, right? Like, and, and this is part of obviously the philosophy in terms of everything that we do. And I guess this is where we love to be purists. But we're, we're sitting down with the R&D team working on a pro- product the other day. And it's designed um, uh, to improve, you know, strength for athletes and stuff like that. Everything in there, including the colour that we use, which is from Gardenia, yeah. actually has antioxidant properties. Yeah. Like, like everything that we we do, we we believe in actually making from nature. Like w- that yeah. statement, nature yep. knows best. And the more you can get back to nature, the more that you can you can. And it doesn't mean you have to be a bloody monk. And this is the thing I want to say. Oh, you know, you, no, no, not at all. Yeah. Just make more better choices mm. and find exactly. options, as you've said. Uh, you know, with your regards to your food and your diet, and 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 life becomes less stressful. You become more mindful of it but you don't have to beat yourself up if if you know you, exactly you can't i mean, live perfectly because who can there are a lot of supplements that have a lot of synthetics in it and and you know and i know mm. don't want to sound like a product flog but we just don't have any there's no synthetic flavors well, or colors yeah it's so true though because i say that to a lot of my clients like obviously a lot of clients come through our door and they are taking atp products like you know like you guys like across the like across the board and I, I have confidence in mm. that. I'm like, they're like, oh, do you want me to stop any of that? And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's fine. So, and, and look, because what, I know, yeah. I know from my point of view that listening to you guys for so many years that you guys are putting good shit in there. Like, it's yeah. not. Yeah. But it's the same when someone will go, well, I can get this protein bar or you know whatever bar for a dollar twenty five, and they, I can get this one. Like, say your one that's out on the market for when you know that's on special, like three or four bucks, and they're like, but you know, I'll get a couple of those. I'm like, but look at the ingredients list. Mm. <laughs> Sorbitol, maltitol. Yeah. You've got all having, sorts of denatured protein in there. Yeah, yeah, two yep. of them a Sucralose, day. Like, yeah. what the hell? Like, yeah. just don't eat it. Go and have a boiled egg then. <laughs> that's exactly, exactly right. And right. we're the Food. first people as well too to understand. We're going to meet people at their point of need, and certainly we're not here. We I, honestly, and I know this is really bad, and we've even got investment, you know, people and all that. We put people before profit because yeah. Zig Ziglar said, if you look after people and help them to where they want to go, then you'll get where you where, where you want to get in life yeah. as well too. It always has to be about people first. It always has to be about helping them at their point of need. But look, we say this as well too unashamedly in the podcast everywhere we go food is medicine quality yeah. eat fresh eat local where you possibly can supplements are designed to to meet a gap in, in today's yeah. busy lifestyle to help those that can't eat perfectly and i love supplementation uh, mm. especially if you've got an you know an acute issue or potentially even a chronic issue i should say yeah. um but 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 also for sports people and that as well too i mean like oftentimes people look around and see that their food is devoid of of certain stuff mm-hmm. um and, and again if you can make up those things with quality that's why atp science came into existence was to help people to bridge those gaps to provide that convenience in a way that wasn't going to compromise on that nature knows best uh, you know sort of philosophy but it will never and you will never hear me say 
say choose choose supplements over food yeah. you know yeah. we, we, that that's that's never our that's never our intention it, it's quite incredible because you know we talk about colorants there's sweet potato is the colorant in that you know so it's like you yeah. mentioned sweet potatoes before i mean these are healthy yeah. foods and and it's quite yeah. incredible because you know go, going back to your to work with the with the gut microbiome i mean all those things those those healthy stress you know sunlight does change the gut microbiome even exercise is a great benefit for your gut microbiome it increases what we call the shannon index which is the diversity which is a positive you want more diversity in your gut there's some sort of yeah the, you're right about the gut being in its infancy in research but there's some sort of we know some things that are bad like the klebsiella's and the e coli's um, we know some things that are pretty good, like the acomensias, but there's some there that are a bit 50-50. Like, uh, for example, going out in the sun increases firmicutes, which you might think, oh, they absorb more calories out of their diet. But that's fine, because if you're out in the sunshine, you may be exercising mm -hmm. or hunting mm -hmm. and gathering, and you need to get more calories out of your food. So nature does know best. Yeah. Well, if you're a baby, yeah. you need firmicutes, right? Yep. I mean, and, you know, if, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're underweight and, and, you know, you could need that. Yeah, so, exercising so, more. And, 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 and it's all about the ratio right again this is the whole thing it's not about destroying one side and yeah exactly like the gut microbiome is just so much of it is about balance and i think the other thing is too like i talk to a lot of my clients about even regards with supplements but they're like cool when do i get to the end of this I, i'm sure you guys have had this. but the thing is like once you start working on your health it is you i'm 20 years into i've probably been working my health longer than that but when i really started focusing when i had my gut name this is i'm two decades on now yep. and i'm still loving it and learning mm. and changing changing things and what worked for me 20 years ago does not work for me now like there's things yes. like you know obviously the underlying fundamentals yes but as my exercise changes as my body composition changes as my estrogen metabolism and heading into perimenopause as all of that changes my you know what i'm doing and what i'm taking changes mm. and so it's been able to always adapt but it is all about balance and i know a lot of people they want these miraculous light bulb things from their practitioners and from their podcast but the boring fact of it is is it's it's, a, it's an adaptation to our life and yeah. what's going on and, adapt and allowing our microbiome to do the same. So we've been between like your bacteroides and your firmicutes and things like that. Like a lot of it is balance. And when you do some of these PCR like style stool tests, you can have a look at that. And that's why that testing is cool. Because if you've got someone who, like you said, is t severely underweight, you can see in a stool test that they, you know, their microbiome has been underfed and you can see that in a stool test. So testing can be really beneficial in that way because if you've got someone who comes in and they're post eating disorder, they're def definitely in recovery, they're willing to work on their gut, but you know they've got, you know, do, you do a stool test or you don't do a stool test and someone goes, well, you clearly just got a, an overgrowth of yeast, we're going to hit your gut with a heap of antimicrobials. You don't mm. want to do that to someone who's got an undergrown mi microbiome. And that's why testing can be really important. You mm. want to build up those, build up the firmicutes, build up the back, like with bacteroides, it's in a bacteriophile and give those guys, you know, a nice robust environment. And if there's still yeast, go in and work with that. Mm. So yeah. that's where testing can be super cool. So it is true. have you got any stories that you can share with us in terms of clients, whether it may be, as you said, uh, someone that's been on antibiotics for too long, someone who's had maybe, um, you know, bulimia, yeah. or, you know, any, <laughs> any really, you got? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, I, I love to hear the stories because I think the stories are sort of, sort of, you know, can really really highlight how you can help people, mm -hmm. especially people that have obviously been frustrated or come into a block wall and all of a sudden you've provided that eureka, hey, this is what's going on and you've been able to treat it. Do you want to sort of share some of those stories? I love stories. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we've got we, we've got heaps. So probably one, I actually mentioned this on one of our podcasts a while ago. She's probably, and I, I like to talk about this one because she is someone who has been so committed to her health but has really stuck to her guns through the highs and lows that treatment definitely and working with a practitioner definitely can present when you're working with the microbiome so she came to me gosh probably maybe five or six years ago and she's still a client now so just to give someone like listeners understanding that if your microbiome is severely compromised the level of time it can take to rebuild and then rework and then adapt um so she came to me severely undergrown, like post, um, it, not eating disorder, but disordered eating resulting from conditions such as SIBO, which I think sometimes gets confused for people. I do think there's a massive amount that we'll look at in the future, hopefully in the disordered eating space, it, the chicken and egg scenario for people um, mm -hmm. in terms of some of it is psychological, but some of it I do believe comes from some massive um, you know, undiagnosed food intolerances and bacterial imbalances where people mm -hmm. have backed themselves into a corner with food and they end up with the weight loss and they end up 
you know, with an under underfed microbiome and, you know, lots of LPS reduction and inflammatory mediators and things like that. So she sort of came to me in that state. Um, and she had been working on her gut for years with um, other practitioners. She'd been on a SIBO biphasic diet as well um, of her own accord. And I think maybe working with other practitioners, I can't remember now, but just this re- and even backed herself into a corner from that. So I know you guys would be familiar with how hardcore SIBO diets can be. And I'm not saying they're bad. We use them in the clinic mm-hmm. as well for the right people in the right context. Um, but just years and years and years have been on this, you know, fiber devoid, just definitely higher protein sort of diet to the detriment of her health and her weight and her hormones. So no period, anything like that going on by this stage. So a gut test back then when we originally did it was a severely undergrown microbiome. I think the original one we did back then was the GI effects, so the big one. Um, it's around seven or $800 mark to test. Um, and so from that, we spent years like doing SIBO. We did SIBO testing and just working with her microbiome and slowly building her microbiome back up. And in the course of all of that, we got hormones kicking back in. We dealt with rosacea. We dealt with wow. like all of the things that happen when you when you feed up your microbiome and things start kicking in and all those biochemical processes start working. They're not always just going to swing back in and work perfectly. So obviously, this is a massive, you know, massive journey over a couple of years. And then we redid a stool test because obviously her gut was good. She was eating great variety of all of her you know fruits vegetables pollens antioxidants all the things you know she's starting to do well in some animal proteins again not all of them because there was a while where she wasn't um starches resistant starches so her diet was very very good her gut function i would say is probably 70 to 80 percent it could have been better but from where she come from obviously you know amazing and amazing to be able to eat and just have people say to her like you look healthy like mm-hmm. you know you're you put on a bit of weight you you've got your period back like your skin looks good um so that was massive for her but then her gut started to go backwards which mm-hmm. <laughs> it does um it happens and that's obviously the ebbs and flows of you know working with people but we're like okay well let's do let's do another test so we did another i think we might have done a geofx test in the middle of all of this as well but we did a test Probably, you know, and being able to look at tests six years or five or six years apart is really cool and yeah. knowing all the work you've done in between. So we went from this severely undergrown microbiome to this one that was just too overgrown, if that's wow. even a thing. Yeah, like, yeah it can it be. Definitely, like, you've just got this abundance of, your de- like, your proteobacterium phylum. So your desulfovibrios, your oxalobacter formigenes, like... Short chain fatty acids are having a bloody gangbuster party right off the Richter scale. Great, right. which is <laughs> normally good. Yeah, yeah, which is normally good. But we all like I know when you do a lot of this testing again, it's all about balance. Like yeah. your short chain fatty acids, you want them to work. But if they're having a massive party, there's a lot of bacterial fermentation happening. We could mm. be dealing with SIBO again and oh, everything mm. like that. So, so it was really cool to see the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, so now we've kind of brought that back into. Realm. So obviously we had to do it again using a lot of dietary manipulation. So a reduction in some of, you know, your sulfur feeders, your your proteins. Um, yeah, so it's just all that food balance, lots of introduction again of more antioxidant, just making sure there's a real focus on that and your polyphenols. We could use some um, herbal antimicrobials at this stage, which was cool to be able to do and do with confidence that we weren't actually damaging the microbiome as opposed to, you know, that person five or six years ago, you probably were doing more harm than good using high dose antimicrobials. Mm. So, yeah, so just in that space, she's, yeah. And that was probably, I think we did that test maybe 12 months ago. So obviously she's in a pretty good place at the moment. Wow, that's great. It's funny. We we talk a lot about... um, exercise on the podcast and we always say you know what if you're going to do it yeah you can go it yourself you can research it but the best thing you can possibly do is go and get a personal trainer who's got runs on the board mm. i call this gut fit because i mean effectively it's gut the same thing true. right you can't have that i'm trademarking it um <laughs> but 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 what you need to do is you need to work with somebody almost like a personal trainer for your gut i mean we know mm. that the gut is so 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 incredible as we've mentioned i mean serotonin mm. i mean obviously l- LPS, which is lipid polysaccharide, yep. is one of the most you know inflammatory things known to man. You've got all sorts of things going on in your gut, uh, and if you can look after that, then then that that would be, I reckon, eighty percent of your health is is is, oh. is well, probably more to yeah. be honest. But but you're right. So this is where the advice, the testing, have a starting point, and then someone to interpret that information and to actually work with you because you've got the wealth of experience of dealing with all these other clients as well too you have the ability to go, you know what, I've seen something like this before. <laughs> you, you can give that advice and that assurance because a lot of time people might even start doing the right thing 
But without that feedback of a professional, yeah. someone who really understands what they're talking about, they can second guess themselves and go off track. So yeah, you know. I also think it's. I also think too, it's really important as a practitioner to not be um, trigger trigger happy. Um, I think really listening to your client is really important and I know I hope a lot of other clinics do this but we spend a lot of time in our consultations we don't do 20 minute consultations with our clients our consultations our initials are an hour and a half to two hours our our follow ups are 45 minutes to sometimes an hour and a half and that's purely because the the beauty and the sometimes the biggest thing you need you don't hear until 45 minutes into the consultation it's that ticket piece that you're like fuck that's what i missed yes that's what i needed to hear and i think as a practitioner like i would rather see five clients in a day but know that i've spent that amount of time with them to pick up everything that i needed to than see 20 clients in a day and miss some of the biggest things that i needed to hear from them so wow that's that's amazing that is amazing i don't hear too many people doing that yeah i just also think too like like our jobs are so mentally demanding like far out i couldn't see 20 clients in a day i'd have a nervous oh. breakdown <laughs> no and, and i get it my stress no i get it actually the funny thing is is that most of the time i feel like that after a, a podcast especially if you've got two like in the afternoon i'm just walking around like a zombie because Stop. you do you're really listening and you're really trying to understand and you're you're right as you're effectively you know a practitioner shouldn't be a tick and flick Yep. Uh, not mentioning any other professions. Shouldn't be how many do we cram through here mm-hmm. so that we can get our thing on the way out. What is it, the Medicare? Oh, but, yeah. but I think in terms of that, that embroilment, because realistically, if you're a trusted um, health carer, really, then yep. then you're right. It's the devil in the detail sometimes. That's the word I was looking for. Devil yeah. in the detail. Oh, thank it you. is. It's, it's so funny because um, there was is a doctor called Dr. Patch Adams. I don't know if you heard of him. Yeah. I did some talks uh, with him about yeah. 10 years ago and he used to see two patients a day because he Amazing. said, yeah, and I said, oh, what, that's pretty slack. And he goes, no, it's about four to five hours each. Wow. He said, yeah. he said I, I don't get to know the disease, I get to know the people. And he said, I treat the people, not the disease. Of he course, said, it's from the, fa- the famous movie with, with Rob Williams. Rob Williams, right? yeah. yeah. I, I, can't, yeah. I can't remember what was, because I spent a few days with him, I can't remember what I remember from the movie or <laughs> remember talking yeah, to right. Patch. Yeah. All I remember about Patch is about six foot six, huge, tall, was guy, he? long hair. I didn't know that. Was he that tall? Oh, he's way taller than me, and I'm six foot, but, you know, yeah. super tall. But, wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and, and hair, he had uh, red uh, one side and blue the other. Because it was the Gesundheit. Um, yeah, the yeah, Gesundheit. Which is just to make people – and again, he Mel used humour you, yeah. and, 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 you know, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I love that famous movie, line from the movie, which is, the, you know, if you if you treat the disease, sometimes you win, sometimes you yeah. lose. But if you treat the patient, you always win. He was he, yeah, he, he sort of says he doesn't really care about the disease. It's, it's semi-irrelevant. To, to how he treats. And, and I said, oh, what were the, you know, w- 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 did, the, did the movie ham it up a bit with the doctors that bad? He goes, no, they're worse than that. Wow. He <laughs> said, they, they just treated me like dirt because I was just so, you know, and, and, and frankly, for as far as doctors are concerned, he's pretty weird. He's even pretty out there for, for natural therapists like us, you know, <laughs> but because he'd have, you know, someone in the audience asked him why he's got two different colours hair and he said, Look, I, I just want people to talk to me so I can help Break down the barrier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not just some coat. Yeah. And how many times have you heard that? I oh, yeah. just talk to the coats, right? Yeah. It's like, no, you're talking to a person. Yeah. And, and, and this is so funny, isn't it? Because I guess this comes down to this question, everything, Steve, that you and I both yeah. fundamentally believe in, is that at the end of the day, we're all people. We need mm. to connect. We, mm. We're not, we're not, you know, living in our own little bubbles. Yeah. And, and, and it's that level of, of professional care that actually comes from, um, a connectedness. And I know that sounds very ethereal for me because I'm not a touchy-feely sort of a <laughs> hippie. You know what I mean? I'm just not. Yeah, um, but, right. I but, totally am. So I'm totally down with what you're saying. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. It is true. And, mm. and I don't want people to dismiss it because they go, oh, that's just hippie talk. It's not. It's actually true. There, there is a, I mean, we've seen it with regards to treating people. I mean, the bait, the experiments that they did during the Second World War of holding babies with rubber gloves and not touching them and oh, yeah. you know, all that sort of stuff, which yeah. showed that there is a level of, of humanity and care Mm. That 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 sometimes you can't distill people down just to a to a line item, yeah. uh, but I, I love what you're doing, mm. uh, Carissa. It sounds amazing. So look, if people if people go, you know what, Carissa sounds amazing. Um, I want to get some still test test done, or I'd like to come and see her and talk about my gut health. Um, where can they come and talk to you? Where can they find out more information? Tell us about your podcast. Tell us everything. 
Yeah, cool. So um, definitely just Instagram's obviously easy for everyone, isn't it? So just Carissa and Nutrition on Instagram. Our clinic is the JCN Clinic. So if you just look for that on Instagram, you guys can, do you guys do show notes? I'm sure you do. Yep. Um, do we do show notes? In. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm sure we do. <laughs> oh, I was going to nod me like, yeah, I hope yeah. you ask me yeah. about it. But... we do with our podcast, but I never do them. I said, just like, chuck that in the show notes. And she's like, <laughs> yep. just give it an epic list. So you can find like, obviously the clinic, JCN Clinic, our website is um, jessicacox.com.au, so you can book through that. Our podcast is on Spotify, all your podcast apps. It's the JCN Clinic Podcast Show. Um, I think we've got about 110 episodes, so we've been podcasting since 2017, and our goal with podcasting honestly I was, we were a bit nervous getting into it but honestly as I think you guys would say it's one of the best things we've ever done because it it really we do a lot of similar stuff to you guys but different obviously but it's all about just making health easy for people to understand um, picking current topics pick talking about testing talking about what's what's relevant to listen to at the moment and what's not sometimes we do get it wrong because then two years later we're like fuck we shouldn't have said that but anyway no you know, that's brilliant um, no no yeah, absolutely yeah. absolutely <laughs> No, yeah, what, 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 one of the things that we absolutely hate, Carissa, is the science is settled. But you're right, and this is the this is wisdom, uh, is actually being able to say, look, this is what the information and research is saying at this point in time. Uh, yeah. But then when new information comes to light, it is humility because you care about your clients and the yeah. truth over your own personal reputation, yeah. which actually I think imp- improves your reputation because you're prepared to say, you know what, you know? And even with your clients, like I learn so much from my clients, you know, like there's so much you can read and research. I'm a podcast junkie. Like I love walking around listening to everything from nutrition. Our podcast, I hope. You know, yes, I definitely. You guys have seen like (laughs) when Lauren emailed me, I was like, I was like, oh shit, this is like fangirl moment. Hey, you know who we've got on our podcast tomorrow since you guys are getting into the hormone space? Yeah. It's Dr. Carrie Jones. Oh, yeah. She is. Yep. She's a, yeah. Is she an endocrinologist or is she just a special? She loves the hormones. I think, I'm not sure if she's an endocrinologist, but I do know, yeah, she was like um, definitely massive hormone nerd. Um, she was the head of Precision Analytical, which is a Dutch podcast. Yeah. Um, wow. Dutch test, sorry. Yeah. I don't think she works for them anymore, but I'll find out tomorrow. But yeah, anyway, so this oh, is like a week for me. No. I've got you guys and her. No, look, oh. it, it's part of a community, again, that I think genuinely, we, we just want to connect with people who genuinely want to take science forward in terms of the natural health and helping mm-hmm. people, which obviously, you, you know, you guys are doing, um, you know, in spades. And it's fantastic for any of our listeners because we don't have that 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 interaction piece that you do. And mm-hmm. we trust you guys, and which is why we obviously want to give you guys a shout out so that if anybody specific, I mean, you treat people from everywhere, right? So it's not just Brisbane. You, you can do online oh, consultations. We're, we're definitely, definitely online majority of the time, especially since covid so definitely yep. Australia wide, and we've got quite a few international clients as well. Right. So brilliant. So oh, so you'll be able to see that in the yeah. show notes as well too. But just again, uh, a website for those that are maybe driving at the moment, and just like yep. you know, um, www.jessicacoxcox.com.au. Perfect, perfect. So you can go there as well too, and you can link to the yeah. podcast on that too. So I, yeah. I know everything's on the website. It's yeah. good. That's how I, I listened to you the other day. So it was good. Yeah. So I I Have you know to one of our podcasts. A few of them, they're great. I, I love the. Oh, thank yeah. You. I, I've got one of my favourite segments, uh, Chris, that I want you to to participate in because um, you're very Australian, and I like oh. this because it's had. Oh, you know, here we so. go. So, so I want to know what your favourite, and and I love this because because we actually get a large percentage of our our, our, our listeners <laughs> listening in from the US, right? So, can I say something really quickly? You yeah. know what cracked me up? I was listening to one of your podcasts. The other day when I was out walking, it was the weird gut questions one. And I don't remember anything about the bloody podcast, but goon bag. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love the Mate, who doesn't love a goon bag? <laughs> oh, jeepers. I was walking along the street, pissing myself, laughing. All I could think, or, think of was, yes, I'm a child of like, you know, probably like similar sort of age, but... I was hoping you were going to get into when we were at school. They used to play a game called Goon of Fortune. Yeah. (laughs) Close line. Yes. (laughs) We used to do that. Oh, Oh, that's awesome. 
You're all right, you're so not so that you old. Yeah. used to st- stand around the ho- hills hoist. Yeah. Now for our American oh, friends, so yeah. it is one. This is a this is our washing line, which was one that you could actually wind up. Yep. And I remember as a kid going out the back um, and jumping on the hills hoist <laughs> and using it as sort of like a cheap Ferris wheel. Yep. So, <laughs> do you remember that? Right. So this is distinctly Australian, and and and, and I like that goon of fortune. So then what yeah. you'd do is you'd tie a goon bag. Everybody yeah. would yeah. stand at certain points. You'd spin yeah. the ho- yeah. hills hoist. Yeah. Lands on has to skull. Oh, yeah. that's awesome! I, love I can't that. remember uh, that. That's like that's like going back to my sixteen-year-old days. I, I thought that thing wasn't done anymore. Like yeah. they didn't have goon bags no. back in the seventeen hundreds, oh, yeah. Steve. Yes, <laughs> but oh, I think that's interesting. So, all right. So, do you? I mean, is that what we're going with, Carissa? Is that your your Australiana uh, sort no, of memorabilia? Do you no. have any words, or do you want to just leave it at the uh, goon of fortune? No. What was the question you were going to ask me? What is your favourite Austral- colloquial Australianism, I guess? What is your favourite Australian word? Like, It's funny because this started with a conversation with Tony and I and um, we were just mucking around. I was getting upset with her and she called me a dickhead or something and I said, ah, shut up your bush pig. And we just then killed ourselves <laughs> laughing for ages. Right? Like, it was just, it was, it was tongue in cheek, right? But it just threw yeah. me back to the 1980s when yep. I was at Springwood High School. Yep. You know, look at that bush pig, you know. It's like, yeah. you know and they were talking about me. <laughs> but, I'm joking. but in terms of, is there any Australiana sort of words? Because I, I want to bring back the biff, like yeah. they used to say yeah, in the football. Remember the that? Yeah. You know, so I want to bring back the Australiana. Uh, you, one of the I, things I'm afraid of is that we become yeah. m- Little America. I don't want to become yeah, Little America. I mean, no. I love yeah. the Americans, but you know what? We're Australian. Yep. We're um, totally Australian. So, I've, got, I've, got quite, I've got quite a few. Yeah. Um, I do have something that it just makes my dad spit his beer across the table. Yeah. When we're like sitting around, and it's piss off your wanker. Uh, <laughs> piss off your wanker. You know what? I don't think there's anything more Australian nah, than piss off your piss wanker. Piss off your wanker. Yeah. <laughs> We, we used to sing at the cricket. Hadley is a wanker. He if was I, not. Oh, I know. Willie really was a wanker. But and then you feel like, because I, I grew up in, in yeah, uh, left Australia. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and we used to have our, our light brown and dark brown <laughs> one day. It was the most terrible uniform ever for playing <laughs> cricket. Terrible. But uh, yeah, Lillian Thompson, specifically oh, yeah. Lillian, is like, yeah, we used to say, come on, Kiwi, come on. And you yeah. guys used to go, come, come on, Aussie. Come on, Aussie. Yeah, you yeah. stole it from us. Did we? We invented no, the pavlova. We, we so didn't. Yeah. Oh. And, and you guys were the, the piss, you know, you know, had Lee as a wanker. We used to say <laughs> Lily as a wanker. Oh, so right. So we invented that. You guys well, just Lily stole it. Lily was probably older than Hadley, so you could be right with that one. Yeah, anyway. Anyway, um, can I just say, being cricket fans, you guys will be really happy to know that between myself and Steph, our receptionist, we actually had the cricket live app and KO set up in the office. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh my gosh! That's awesome. You, you, <laughs> so you, that you, is you, awesome. You guys are quintessentially Australians, then. We are Steph and I definitely. We are both, we both love a beer and we love the cricket. Yeah, so when that's she great. Because as we're recording this now, and you know it'll be history, but it, it, day one in Perth, Australia's on top at to two for two ninety four. Uh, now, how the hell do I remember that? While we're talking all Australia, and I know this is going to come out, you know, probably with yeah. Christmas holidays. I'm not sure, but Australia's just made it right through to the round of sixteen. Oh yeah, the so World like, Cup. in the World Cup football, right? So we oh, just okay. beat. Yeah, yeah. Denmark, mind you, you know who we're yeah. bloody well playing now. Argentina. Argentina, freaking gone. Tina. Gone. Who, you know, so either which way we're going to lose because my yeah. sons love Messi and like that'll oh. be, if we beat them, we're not going to beat Ooh. them. No. Hey, never say never. Never say never. Never say never. Yeah. We, say we never. could bring out some sandpaper and just, uh, you know, alter the ball a bit. <sighs> We've done that before. <laughs> You'd know that, wouldn't you? I know. Well, why don't they actually roll the ball under their arm oh, yes. on the pitch, right? Despicable. <laughs> Australians. See, I switch. I'm a team oh, yeah, coach. I'm, so, I'm a New Zealander sometimes, yeah. especially when we're talking about the All Blacks. The rest of the time, I'm Australian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Fair call. Fair call. Oh, dear. Chrissa, it's been absolutely brilliant to have you on the podcast. Thank um, you. Thank always. you so much for having me. Oh, no, it's been really, really fun. We'll have you back on again. And yep. look, um, guys, please, yeah, you've got the link notes. You've heard um, where Chris is from as well, too. And if you are American or from overseas, they take um, overseas clients as well too. But look, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And, um, sure. you know, thanks, thanks for coming guys. on. And we'll see you again soon, hey? Thank you. All right, Bye. see you later. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye.